So I'd ask you today, hey, listen, what are you worried about? Oh, come on now. You know what you're worried about, right? Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's some procedure you've got or something you've had. Or maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's the children. What, are, what is it you're worried about? Can I tell you something? If you'll saturate yourself and permeate yourself with the presence of God, and you will come to understand the providence of God, His peace will flood your soul. take your copy of God's Word and be finding Acts chapter 4 today. Acts chapter 4. And um, let me just say, if you're visiting, that uh, we've been making our way through the book of Acts for, um, well, since about the end of January, I believe. And uh, we find ourselves in Acts 4, about to getting close to wrapping that up. You know, we, I think we've all heard the phrase, comparison shopping, right? I mean, com what is comparison shopping? It's when you take two or more, three, four items and compare them. You may compare the price. That's one normal, natural thing that we do. You may compare um, the features. If it, maybe it's an appliance. Maybe it's some kind of product, but you would compare the features. This one does this. This one does that. Um, maybe it's food, you know, how many times now with the onset of generics, I mean, generics have really gotten really big, you know, Hey, Kellogg's makes fruit loops, but guess what? Kroger makes fruit loops. Now they just call it something different and all kinds of things. And so we look at the ingredients and we say, man, are, are these going to be the same? Are they going to taste the same? Maybe you're in the pharmacy at Walmart and you think, okay, Vicks makes a cold medicine, but so does Equate or Walmart makes a cold medicine. And so you check the ingredients. Uh, the milligrams and the dose, all that kind of stuff. And so that's comparison shopping. Well, today, what I want us to think about is this phrase, comparison saints. We're going to compare saints. Now, we have to be very, very careful when we compare with other people. I was listening to a message my son preached here about two weeks ago, and uh, he made a great, I thought it was a great statement. He said, comparison is the enemy of contentment. And I began to think about that. I thought, man, that's good. That's really good because, you know, when you start comparing yourself with others, maybe financially, maybe uh, physically, materially, relationally, there's going to be discontentment. Look at where they live. Look at what they drive. Look at who they're married to. Look, look at, and so you start looking at all those physical, material, financial things, and man, your contentment just washes away. And so comparison many times is the enemy of contentment. And so that's not what we want to do. We're not going to compare in a physical, material, financial kind of a way. We're going to compare spiritually. Now listen, we also have to be careful comparing spiritually because one of the things we don't want to do, I look at all these instruments and I see all these people come up here and play and sing. What we don't want to do is, is compare ourselves and say, well, I can't sing like those ladies do. I can't play like those guys do. And so, and so we have, there again, there's that open door for, for jealousy and discontentment and so on and so forth. So we're not going to compare that way. What, what I want us to do is we've all been down to the uh, hospital on the third floor when someone's had a little, a little baby and you go in there and you're looking at that little baby and, um, and then maybe you look at the mom, you look at the dad, you look at the grandparents, they're there. And, and I titled the message today and you, you'll hear this phrase down at the hospital in one of the rooms. They'll say, I can see the resemblance, right? They look at the baby, they look at the mom. I can see the resemblance. They look at I mean, proud granddads over there. Oh, I can see the resemblance. So, so we're, we're, that's what I'm talking about. So we see that. So here's what I want us to do today when we talk about comparison saints. I want us to look at the saints, the New Testament saints in the book of Acts, and compare them to the New Testament saints at first Dover, 
and see if we can honestly and sincerely say, I can see the resemblance. Man, I hope we can. I pray that we can. It's my heart's desire that we can see that kind of resemblance with the New Testament saints. So that's what I want us to do today, okay? That's the title of the message. Now, uh, we have people visiting. We'll have new people watching this online and so forth. And so I need to take just a couple of minutes to review real quickly. Because all of what goes on in chapters 3 and 4 have to do with this one incident. What, what happened in that incident? Well, if you've been here last few weeks, you know. Peter and John are on their way to the temple, okay? And they, um, they're, just, they're going to church, just like you and I would go to church. And they're going to worship, they're going to pray, they're going to do, do their thing, okay? And so, they're on their way, and we talked about evidence of having been with Jesus. And one of the evidences of having spent time with Jesus is compassion. And so, on their way, they see a lame man. The Bible said he's been that way for over 40 years. And he is by the temple, one of the gates going into the temple, and he is begging alms. He is begging for money. And so all of a sudden, Peter and John see this man, and their eyes lock on this man, and that compassion that was in the Lord Jesus stirs within Peter and John. And so they look down at the guy, and they tell him, look at us. And so that guy immediately does look at them, thinking, the Scripture says, that he's going to get some money. Well, Peter utters those famous words, those wonderful words, Maybe somewhat disappointing at first to the man when he first hears them, but man, how wonderful they were when he got finished. He says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Get up and walk. And the Bible says that that man not only got up, he began walking he began leaping, and he began praising God. So it was a wonderful miracle, wonderful miracle. Well, all these people are watching. It's, it's, it's a hustle and bustle there around the temple, a lot of people. And so a crowd starts gathering and saying, man, I know that guy. Man, he's been laying there forever. Crawls in, crawls out, begs every day. Man, that, what a miracle. And so, man, it, it's, and, and Peter sees this as, as a great opportunity because the people mistakenly credit Peter and John with the miracle. They say, wow, look at this great miracle you guys have performed. You guys are awesome. You're going to be our new Savior. You're going to be our new... And Peter immediately says, hold your horses. And he says a couple of weeks ago, it's the title of the message, let me set the record straight. And so he, he clears up the matter. He says, no, this power that has healed this lame man did not come from me. It did not come from John. The power that healed this man, make no mistake about it, came from the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. That's the power that has done this today. And so he preaches this mini-sermon, if you will, and guess what? 5,000 people are saved. 5,000 people become followers of Christ that day. And I mean, a crowd is building and there's a buzz going. And, 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 and on the one hand, listen, there is a celebration because of what's taking place. But on the other hand, there is consternation on the part of the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and the priests and the religious leaders there that day. Celebration over here consternation over here. And so those religious leaders, they arrest Peter and John. They bring them in, start questioning them, and start talking to them, and start listening to them. And they, de they decide, hey, this guy's been with these guys have been with Jesus. Now here, listen to this. They tell them, we don't want you to speak anymore in his name. We don't want you to teach anymore. You can teach. You can preach. Hey, you can even heal if that's what you want to do, but you can't do it in his name. And so they send them back out. So that's kind of where we are. So let's Let's look, let's pick up from there. That's a basic context and background of, of the passage that we want to look at today, okay? So we're going to review some of that now as we read in chapter 4, 
And let's go down to verse 13. He's just preached that message, and, and he's told them, the, these leaders, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you can be saved. It's only in Jesus. And now pick up in verse 13 with me. Acts 4, verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence, that is the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to go aside of the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny that. But in order that it may not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you, rather than to God you be the judge. But we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and what we've heard. And when they had threatened them further, they let them go without finding no, uh, go finding no basis on which they might punish them on account of all the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had, was performed. Now, the, uh, here's what I want us to do. We're comparing the saints. We're looking at the saints in the book of Acts, and we will look at the saints here today at First Baptist Dover and any who might be watching this later on on the internet, okay? And so here's what we want to see. What was in them that should be evidence in us where we could say, yes, I see the resemblance? Well, number one, New Testament saints will faithfully permeate with the presence of God. Now, that may be a strange way to say that, but I think you'll understand where I'm going with that word in just a moment. Faithfully permeate with the, with the presence of God. The word permeate, what does it mean? Well, it means to, to be so saturated, it's just absolutely full. There's no more you can put in there. And it's almost so full that it now begins to go back out. Okay, so it can be so permeated that now it begins to radiate back out. And I, I, I thought about this illustration when I was writing this. Have you ever been into it? And they used to do this. I don't know if they still do or not. But you go to a hotel room and, or go to a hotel front desk and they say, what, do you want a smoking or non-smoking room? Well, if you don't smoke, you'd obviously say, I, don't want a non, I want a non-smoking. But have you ever been in a room that was a smoking room? We probably all have. And when you go in that room, the, I don't care how much stuff they spray, it, trying to cover it up, it's just there. Why? Because that smoke absolutely permeates everything in the room. It gets in the carpet, it gets in the curtains, it gets in the cushions, it gets everywhere. And it just, it gets so saturated and permeated that now it radiates back into the room, okay? And so we, we've all... We've all experienced that kind of a thing. Now, we can, we can use this in a, um, oh, I don't know, a, maybe this is a negative way. And by the way, today is Jerry Master's birthday. Did you know that? <laughs> Happy birthday to Jerry. But I was thinking about Jerry, and I hated to even use this illustration on his birthday, but I think it's really, really important to understand what I'm trying to say. Let's just imagine, Jerry's been working with hogs all his life. He knows them very well. And let's just say Jerry is down, maybe yesterday for all I know, probably true, but he was down working with his hogs. And I don't know, he does all, gets out there in the stalls with them and he's feeding them, he's giving them shots, he's do whatever he does with them all day long. Maybe six, seven, eight, ten hours, okay? It was what, 94, five degrees yesterday? So he's out there doing that. Now, Jeannie's at back at the house, and she's uh, maybe went to the grocery store, maybe do some cleaning, whatever. But they, and, and, and they, like a lot of couples, don't even communicate what they're going to be doing that day, okay? He does his thing, she does her thing, okay? She's back at the house and doing this and that. Well, it's the end of his eight or ten hours out there messing with the hogs. And so he comes back in the door. She knows immediately where he has been. Have you ever noticed you know where somebody's been without them saying a word? She knows exactly where he's been, if you get my drift. Because she got his drift, if you get my drift. Okay? Can I hear an amen? 
You know what I'm talking about. I don't need to go any farther, do I? Okay, so, and that's, that's kind of in a negative way. I'll tell you in a positive way. I don't know if this is positive or not, but my kids sometimes. Did you know you can go to a restaurant, and maybe they had gone to La Herta's or maybe a Chinese restaurant, and they come in the door, you know, it's later on that night, and they come in the door, and I, and I, I know where you've been. And they, oh, and they, they're getting all frantic. What, what, they don't, what have I, where have I been? I said, you've been to La Hurt. I can smell the fajita on you. I can smell the chicken quesadilla on you. Where's mine? You know, kind of a thing. So I'm just saying we can get so permeated with, uh, if you want to call it a smell, that it radiates back. And sometimes you don't even have to say a word. We can figure it out pretty quick. Well, there's a great verse that talks about this. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 15. Our lives, look at this, our lives are a Christ-like fragrance. Christ-like fragrance. Rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. In other words, the New Testament saints are going to have, they're just going to smell like Jesus. Now, the, the key, listen, the key verse in this whole thing is verse 13. It says, they, Peter and John standing before him, they observed them. Notice that they observed them. They're looking at them. And they say, man, these guys have been with Jesus. They look like Jesus. They talk like Jesus. They, 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 they act like Jesus. They even smell like Jesus, okay? That's, that's what I'm saying. They are so filled with his presence that it just spills back out. And so that's what's happening. And so this verse is saying our lives are to be a Christ-like fragrance. Now, some people are going to like that. Believers, other Christians, man, they're going to love that. Wow. Have you ever been around somebody, they just walk into the room and you just, and I, I know we're talking smelling, but I'm saying not so much in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, you can just smell Jesus on them. They just have this aura and this aroma about them that you just, you just sense Jesus, his love and his grace and his compassion and their, their humility and all the, you just sense Jesus. Okay, and so he's saying some people are going to love that. And then he's going to, and then that verse goes on to say, he says, some people, they're not going to like that. Those who are perishing, they don't like that. So the Sanhedrin, they were offended by the smell of Peter and John standing before them. They were offended by what they saw because they saw Jesus. They observed them as having been with Jesus. They looked like Jesus, talked like him, and even smelled like them. And so here, here are these saints. Now, here's what you have to remember. Just a few weeks before, two or three weeks before, Jesus had been standing before this same council, the, the same Sanhedrin, the, the, the Sadducees and the, and the priests. Jesus himself stood before these very same people. And they looked out at Jesus and they said, this is a lowly Jewish carpenter. He's a nobody. And they listen to him, they question him, and what authority are you doing this, and who told And they're doing all the same things. Now, all of a sudden, it's just a few weeks later, Peter and John are standing before the same people. And they look at him, and according to that verse, they observe that they too are untrained, they're uneducated, they're a couple of lowly fishermen. And so the thing, they're coming to a conclusion. They're putting two and two together. This guy... Jesus has influenced these two guys, Peter and John. And what I see in them, what we see in them, we saw in him. And so that's the conclusion that they're making, okay? And so there, there's just a certain quality about committed followers that they are just, they just, they're permeated and they radiate the presence of the Lord back to those around them. I'll tell you who's a great example of this is Moses. Do you remember when Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai? And he's coming back down. Remember that? He's coming back down. And the Bible says that his face just shone with the glory of God. He didn't even know it. Listen to this verse. Exodus 34, 29. When Moses came down Mount Sinai carrying the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant... He wasn't even aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken, spoken to the Lord. He was so permeated 
with the glory of God and it radiated back to the people. They had to put a veil over his face. They were being blinded because of the glory, because he had been in the presence of God. Peter and John had been in the presence of the Lord Jesus. So what happens? Well, in verse 18, they said, okay, they come to this conclusion. These two guys were with him. I see the same things in them that I saw in him. We thought we were done with that Jesus, and now here they are doing what they're doing in his name. And boy, this just gets under our skin. So what do they do? Verse 18, they summoned them and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Okay? And so here they are. There's a big crowd and there's a lot of hubbub and a, and a buzz going on. And so they said, man, because of the people, I, I don't think we can punish them. Man, we'll, get, we'll have a riot on our hands. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's command them to not speak, teach, preach, heal in his name. And then we'll send them on our way and We'll whisper a prayer and maybe it'll, maybe it'll happen or so forth. So they command them not to speak, preach, or teach in his name. Now here, that got me to thinking. I want to ask you a question. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to put it up on the screen because I want you to see it very clearly and I want you to think about it. If you were commanded, if you were commanded to not speak about Jesus, to not pray in his name, to not speak in his name, what effect would that command have on you? If you are commanded, don't you speak in his name. Don't you pray in his name. Don't you do that. What effect would that have on you? You say, well, boy, well, that's a shame. What a pity. I guess I better not do it. I've been commanded. You say, well... That day's not coming. Listen, let me tell you something. That day's not coming. That day in many ways is already here. It's already here. I get so frustrated when I see around the country. You know, we see it over here at, our, at, at the school district with, our, with football, football games. Simple things, of just praying for the Lord to help us and protect our kids. You know, help us be good sports. And then we pray and we in Jesus' name, amen. And then you got two or 3,000 people at a game. And one person says, I don't like that. And so they, get, they go behind the, whatever they do, and they send a letter and they threaten a lawsuit. We command you not to do that anymore. We command you to not speak or pray in his name. Don't do that. Or the federal government will say, we're going to withhold funding. We're not going to give you money. You've got to have money to operate. Let's see how long you can last without the money. And so they command it. And so what I'm saying to you is this, this day is not coming. This day is here. So my question to you is what effect is it going to have on us? Well, I think we would do well to compare to the New Testament saints in Acts with what we do today. So they're commanded, don't, don't do it anymore. But you, and that's a big problem. It, it's, it's a big problem what, what went on. But let me tell you something that I think is the bigger problem. Is that far too many times Christians who claim to know Jesus and have him in, his heart, have him in their heart don't even mention his name. My goodness, we talk about politics, we talk about sports, we talk about our music, we talk about movies, we talk about our arthritis, we talk about our sinus infections, we talk about everything, but we don't talk about Jesus. So, let, you know, a lot of times I give you a timeless truth. Can I give you a terrifying truth? Let's change the name of it because it is terrifying. Listen to this. The New Testament saints in Acts were, were being pressured, now look at this, not to speak the name of Jesus, while the overwhelming majority of Christians today must be pressured to speak about Jesus and his name. You see my point? They were commanded, don't you do it, and then we get up here and stand behind the pulpit and we get in our Sunday school class and say, oh, I beg you to go do it. Please go tell some. please invite somebody, please tell them about Jesus this week. Would you please do it? I beg you to do it. They were commanded not to do it. We're begged to do it. Well, there's a, there's a resemblance that I don't like as I look at it. So, so here, here they are, commanded not to do it. What's their response? I love it. Look at verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, man, you be the judge. In other words, we don't answer to you, we answer to God. And I would say that to anybody. And I'm going to show you here in just a minute in chapter 5 the response of what happens on this whole deal. But their response is, we can't help it. 
You can command us. You can scold us. You, you can threaten us. But we can't help it. We're going to keep talking about him. We're going to keep doing what we've been doing. Okay? And so, anyway. So, when we compare saints, I see the resemblance. As we look back at the New Testament saints in Acts, what we see there are Christians who faithfully permeate with the presence of God. Number two, we see saints who find peace in the provision of God. Man, I love this part of it. They find peace in the providence of God. Now, look in verse 23. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David your servant said this, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand to, and, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city... They were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, that's the Romans, and all the peoples of Israel, that's the Jews. Now look at verse 28. To do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. Now here's what's going on. They said, okay, don't go preach, don't go teach anymore in his name. We're threatening you, we're warning you, you better listen to me, I mean it. You'll be in serious trouble. Now get out of here. And so they leave. They've been threatened, they've been pressured, they've been warned, they've all these ridiculed. And so what do these two guys do? I love what they did. They went to church. That's what they did. They went back to church. Verse 23, it says they went back to their companions. So they go back to what we would call the church, the assembled believers, and they walk into the room. And, and they come in, and the first thing, and, and you can just imagine it, can't you? What happened? We saw that they took you. We saw that they took you aside and rested you and kept you there overnight. And, and what, what did they say? What did they do? And, and man, pe people are just wanting to know. We want the inside scoop. And so... The first thing Peter and John do is they go back and they say, yes, all that happened. But here's the thing. They didn't have a pity party. You know, sometimes we gather and we have a pity party. All the bad things that are happening, all the stuff going on, we just have a pity party. They didn't have a pity party. You know what they did? They had a praise God for his providence party. Praise God for his providence. That's what they did. And so notice, notice they, verse 24, they said, man, he's the creator. Verse 27, they said, he's in control. And so just imagine the scene, if you will, for just a moment. They're in there. Peter and John walk in. They said, man, what happened? Peter says, man, I'll tell you what happened. Man, they brought us before them, and they, they got all over. I mean, they scolded us. And somebody in the group says, praise God. Amen. Peter said, well, okay, all right, well, yeah, what else? Well, man, I'm telling you, they, they warned us. I mean, they absolutely threatened us. Somebody in the back, hallelujah, praise the Lord. He says, man, they ridiculed, they made fun of us. They scolded us. They pressured us. Some, hallelujah, praise Jesus. And so the more they talked about all the negative things that happened, the more people started giving popcorn praises the Lord and, 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 and thanking God for it all. You say, why in the world, with all the negative things that were happening and what was happening, they were saying, why would the church be saying praise the Lord and thank you, Jesus? Because they understood, maybe you could say, finally, we wouldn't have been any different. They understood finally the providence of God. Because notice what they do. They said, Lord, you've created everything. You're in absolute control. Okay? And then they go back in verse 25 and 26, and they're quoting from the Psalms. It's Psalm 2. It's a messianic psalm. And it's in that psalm that God says through David, he says, the world's going to ridicule my, my chosen one. He's going to, the world's going to reject my Christ. And they're going to ridicule him. They're going to reject him. They're going to persecute him. They're going to slander him. They're going to do all these things. But here's what they understood. 
God was in control of it all. Because notice what they say in verse 27. They said, all these things that, and by the way, the, old, the New Testament saints, they knew their scripture. Because they quote Psalm 2 and all those things. And they said, here's the fulfillment. We have lived the fulfillment. We've seen what's happened. Verse 27. We saw Herod come against your anointed one. We saw Pontius Pilate. We saw the Gentiles. We saw the Romans. We saw the people of Israel. We saw the Jews. They all came against him. We saw this happen right before my very eye, our very eyes. And so what they knew, and here's what they concluded. God ordained it all. His providential hand, his sovereign hand was over all of it. So here's the truth that brought peace, Okay. God, they knew that God was in control of it all. And he not only knew what would happen, listen, he said it would happen, Psalm 2 and many other places, and, that, and he engineered it to happen all to fulfill his purpose. So these people, that New Testament, when he, they come in and say, man, we were persecuted, we were ridiculed, we were pressured, we were scorned, we were all these things, they're praising God. Why? Because God ordained it all. God was in control of it all. He knew about it. He said it would happen. He even engineered it to happen. And so they're praising God for his providence. That's where peace comes. You understand that? Say amen. Man, I love that. Man, I love that. I'm telling you. If, if, if we will understand the providence of God, I'm telling you, you'll sleep a lot better at night. If, you, if, you, if you'll start resting in the providence of God, you won't be so easily offended and have your feelings hurt all the time. If you'll rest in the providence of God. If you'll rest in the providence of God, you won't fear persecution. You're not going to worry like you do. If you understand the providence of God, it will flood your soul with peace. Because listen, your life is in his hands. That's what they're saying. That's the conclusion they draw. All these negative things. <laughs> they're saying God was in control. He's in control. He created it. He controls it. And they find peace in the providence of God. And that's what New Testament saints do. Okay? So I'd ask you today, hey, listen, what are you worried about? Oh, come on now. You know what you're worried about right? Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's some procedure you've got or something you've had. or Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's the children. What, are, what is it you're worried about? Can I tell you something? If you'll saturate yourself and permeate yourself with the presence of God and you will come to understand the providence of God, his peace will flood your soul. His presence and His providence. Now there's the third thing they do. Can we see the resemblance? They faithfully permeate with the, uh, with the presence of God. They find peace in the providence of God, but then they firmly proceed in the power of God. Now I want you to, I want you to see what they did, in their reaction, if you will. Uh, so Peter comes into the prayer, he comes into the church, and they ask him what happened, and he lists all these negative things, and they're praising God. And then they do something that, we, listen, I bet it happened 15 or 20 times already this morning in our Sunday school class and so forth. One of the teacher or somebody got in there, and they said, they asked a question just like this. They said, does anybody have any prayer requests? And so somebody wrote, well, I do pray for that. I do pray for this. I do pray for that. And so the church lists their prayer requests. Okay. I don't know if it was Peter who stood up or if anybody stood up, but somehow they started taking a prayer request. And that's what I want you to know. I want you to notice. Here's their request. They, they said, we've been told not to speak in his name. And our prayer request is this, that we will boldly go speak in his name. That's what we're praying for. Okay. Look at it in verse 29. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants, now here it is, may speak your word with all confidence, with boldness, while you extend your hand to heal and do signs and wonders that take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed that prayer, when they asked for boldness to proclaim his name, even though they'd been told not to do it, that place where they had gathered was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. The saints said, all right, Lord, you're sovereign. 
You're in control. Nothing takes you by surprise. Here we have been commanded not to speak in your name. Our prayer today is that you would help us not only speak in your name, but to do it with great boldness and great power. And so that's why I say they firmly proceed, firmly proceed in the presence, in the power of God, okay? And so let me give you a timeless truth along these lines. God delights in answering prayers that are prayed in accordance to his will. We know from Acts 1-8, he had told them, you will be my witnesses. And so here, what are they praying? They're praying, Lord, would you help us to boldly speak your name? Listen, God rejoices and answering our prayers when we pray them in accordance to his will. Let me give you some, a, a couple of quick examples, okay? First of all, let me give you a principle and a prayer, okay? Principle, prayer. Principle is what God has said, and then the prayer. The principle in Matthew 6, God says, don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about where you're going to live. Don't worry about, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And so that's the principle, Now, here's our prayer. When we read that principle, and we read what God has said, and then we pray something like this, God, help me not to worry. Help me to trust in your provision, in your protection. I'm going to tell you something. God delights in answering that prayer. Why? Because you prayed it according to the principle that he's already laid out. Another example, Proverbs 3. Trust the Lord with all of your heart. and Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your path, okay? So when we, 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 when we read that principle, trust Him with everything that's within Him, and we come and we, we pray something like this, Lord, would you help me? You see what I'm going through. Would you help me to trust you? Not, not with some of my heart, but with all of my heart. Help me not to connive. Help me not to manipulate. Help me not to try to work it out. Help me just to trust you with all of my heart, with all of my being. I just surrender to you. I'm just trusting you. I'm not going to lean on me. I'm going to lean on you. I'm telling you, God rejoices to answer that prayer. And I mentioned to you the Acts 1.8. He said, you shall be my witnesses. That's the principle. That's what God said. And so when we come and we pray just like that early church prayed, Lord, would you give me boldness? This week to proclaim your name and to speak about you. I'm telling you, God rejoices to answer that prayer. All right? So these, God delights in doing that. Let me give you a verse. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything in accordance to his will, he will answer it. So we read the principles over here. We know that's his will. So when we pray in his will, he said, you're going to have the answer. I'm going to bless you with an answer. Okay? So God answers their prayer. It's really kind of cool because they go and they ask, they ask in verse 29, would you grant that we might speak your word with all confidence and boldness? And so the Bible says in verse 30, so they ask the prayer in verse 29, but in verse 31, it's answered in the place they, the, where they were was shaken. Let me ask you a question real quick. Do you think God would ever shake this place? Man, do you think he'd ever shake this place? I think he would if he, we'd see the resemblance. Between us and them, I think he'd shake this place. And so the Holy, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, let me ask you, we talked about this in the very first part of this. What was evidence that they were filled with the Holy Spirit? Were they running around acting like crazy people? No, that's not what they were doing. Notice what it says. It says what they were doing. They began to speak the Word of God with boldness. <laughs> that was the evidence. It's just amazing how God answered that prayer. Well, turn over. I wasn't going to do this, but give me just one minute. Turn to Acts 5. The, the Peter and they're brought back before the same people again. Now remember what they've been commanded. Now look at the response. Acts 5, verse 27. And you're going to see how God answered the prayer. And when they had brought them again and stood before the council, the high priest questioned them, saying, Now look at this. Here it is. We gave you strict orders. We warned you. We threatened you. We pressured you. We, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in His name. And yet, you, now here it is. They asked for, Lord, would you help us to speak forth your word with boldness? What was the answer? It says, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood on us. You have filled Jerusalem. We told you not to do it anymore, and now Jerusalem is filled with the teaching and preaching of this man's name. God answered that prayer. Well, isn't that good? Man, I just love the Word of God. So when you go down to the hospital and you pick up that little baby and you pick up that little grandbaby and you're holding them, you're smiling, they're taking those little, the little selfies and the pictures and everything, and you're right under there, I can see the resemblance. 
I want to ask you a question. As we look at the New Testament saints in the book of Acts, and we look at the New Testament saints gathered in this room today, the ones who are watching on the internet, can we say honestly and sincerely, I can see the resemblance because they're so saturated and permeated with the presence of God. They are so firmly convinced of the providence of God that even in the midst of storms, they can say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. He's the creator, he's in control. And they absolutely are living in the power of Almighty God. You ever have any problems? All right, I'm going to start all over. Let's start. If you'll turn in your book, Bibles to Acts chapter 4, we'll start back over. Do you ever have any problems? Amen. I want to to leave you with a timeless truth. I'm telling you, if you just get it in your heart, I mean, get it in your heart, write it in your Bible and get it in your heart. Here it is, and I'm through. It's so much easier to face the problems of life when we've spent time in the presence of God, having an understanding of the providence of God, dependent upon the power of God. I'm telling you, when you'd get that truth, down in your heart, not just in your head, but in your heart, and you live it, I'm telling you, we'll begin to see the resemblance of the saints at First Baptist Dover with the saints in the book of Acts. Let's pray together. Wow. Lord, thank you for the, the challenge of your word today. And Man, I had, to, I had to look in the mirror, and I have to say, Lord, can... can Can I see a a resemblance? Am I so permeated with the presence of God that I just smell like Jesus? Well, I pray we'd ask that question today. Are we trusting in your providence? Do we have peace or are are our lives filled with worry, concern? We've forgotten your sovereign God. We've forgotten that nothing happens without heaven knowing about it. Sometimes not only do you know about it, you engineered it. So may we find peace in your providence. And Lord, when we think about our prayer request, we think about this old world and how dark it is and how it comes against everything of Christ. Lord, we need to, we need to firmly proceed under the power of God these days. Well, nothing's really changed. So would you help us, Lord, to be not so much looking around at each other. I need to be more like this person. That, but we need to be more like the New Testament saints in the book of Acts where others would see that resemblance. I pray that would be true. That's my heart's desire for these people that I shepherd. It's my heart's desire for my heart. And Lord, you hear it as our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, would you stand with me? And I want to give you an opportunity to respond. If God has put a, a decision on your heart and you need to pray, you can come. If you need to you need counsel with you, I'll be glad to do that, pray with you. Let's be obedient and let's do business with how, how would the Lord have me to apply this message today? Man, you think through that. If you want to sing, you can sing. But if you just want to get on your knees and pray, you just pray. But how would he have me apply this to my heart and my life today? Let's do business with the Lord.